Hello and welcome everyone. We'll be starting in just a moment. Glad you guys can join us. We've got a great guest this evening and we'll have a lot of great things to cover looking at Lightroom. Please feel free in the chat pod to let us know where you're joining in from. And if you wanna take advantage of the Q&A to put your questions in for things you'd like to learn inside of Lightroom tonight, please feel free to do so. We'll definitely be tackling a bunch of cool stuff here in just a few moments. Really glad you guys can join us. Thanks for making it. Welcome. Glad you guys can be here. I see one message in the chat pod. So let's see where you're chiming in from. Two messages, good. Good to hear from everyone. Hello from Australia. And it's very wet. Hello from Melbourne, Florida. Yes, <laughs> B, you are in Florida. It's also very wet here today. I'm in uh, just outside of Washington, DC. So we're glad you guys can uh, be with us here today. Welcome. This is our Lightroom Hangout and it's brought to you in part by the folks over at Aftershoot. They make a really cool product we'll show you later that helps automatically sort through your images before you import them into Lightroom or even after. And it'll help enhance your images and uh, identify which ones are the best. So what it does is it analyzes everything and it's able to identify the photos that stand out from the rest which is great so that you don't have to spend so much time sitting there sorting to find the best pictures. So thank you guys for joining us. Again, this event is being brought to you in part by the folks at Aftershoot. So we encourage you to check that out. We'll talk a little bit more about them. Uh, my name is Rich Harrington. I am a visual storyteller and uh, I enjoy taking a look at where photo and video intersects. I've been using Lightroom for a long time and I'm also the publisher over at photofocus.com. Uh, through the years, I've put out about 40 books, including several books on photography and video. And I've also published a lot of classes about Lightroom as well as other photo software tools. And I've had the chance to speak at many conferences through the years, including WPPI, Photo Plus Expo, Photoshop World, Visual Storytelling Conference, and AB and others. So glad you guys can join us. And uh, that's just a little bit about me. I'd like to introduce our guest this evening, and our guest is Robert Vanelli, also known as Vanelli. We've gone back a, a long time. Uh, v, I think you and I have been pushing pixels around on a screen together and helping people learn about photography. I want to say it's going on 20 years now, but that would make you old and me almost old. <laughs> How are you doing today? Very good. Very, very good. Now, yeah. I, I know you, you were married in 1999, but I tell everyone, that was when I met Harrington. So that's a special. <laughs> so that's more than 20 years. Thanks for pointing that one out. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, Vanelli is a sports photographer as well as a photo educator. He's spoken at events like Photoshop World, the Visual Storytelling Conference, ClickCon, and many others. And he has an official role over at Skylum Software. Uh, some of you might have seen him hosting their regular Coffee Break series. And uh, he knows his way around Luminar quite well. We're going to be working with Lightroom tonight, but we are going to show you how to use plugins with Lightroom later this evening. And that'll work with all plugins. And we're going to show you some really cool workflows. This includes how to use smart objects, how to round trip things, how to really combine technology. So that's awesome. So welcome to our Lightroom Hangout. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And remember, you guys are welcome to ask questions during tonight's event. So feel free to put those into the chat or the Q&A. Uh, we welcome those. We'd be glad to uh, hear your thoughts and what's on your mind. But uh, Vanelli, why don't I let you kick it off? Why don't you give us a nice Lightroom tip just to open up the doors and help people learn a few things? And then we'll get into the third-party plugins and the workflows here in a little bit. Gotcha. All right, let me share my screen. Good. Now you should be seeing my screen right about now. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, can I talk a little bit about Aftershoot, what it just did for me or... Sure. I'm going to hold off on that. So this particular photo shoot was um, with one of the models I, I normally work with. Her name is Ashley. Absolute incredible model to work with. We've gotten to the point where we're able to narrow our shoots down and only shoot maybe under 50 images. So with that being said, um, here's after shoot here. Let me pull that up. Right there. So here's after shoot. And I was really shocked um, because I got turned on to this, you know, by photo focus and with Ashley for this particular shoot we only shot 27 images but if you notice where it says plus three and so on that's telling me that those after shoot looked at those images and realized you know what 
they're extremely similar. And sure enough, they were. And then it narrowed down its selection to like seven. And the ones that it felt, like in this case here, that there were three almost identical photos, which you see, it let me choose. Well, it chose the best one and then gave like other star ratings to the other ones. I just went in and just gave them zeros. And it came up with these seven out of like the 27 that we shot. And once I exported them, I was able to bring them into Lightroom here. And I was just amazed that it was able to bring over not just the images, but the metadata with it, the star ratings, you know, and of course green for five star um, or for selects. Then from here, I get to pick which of these are my favorite images that I really want to spend time with. And that's what I want to talk to you. When do you use Lightroom and when do you use a third-party plugin? It depends. I mean, it's like a carpenter has more than just one hammer. He has a lot of tools at, his, at their disposal. Same thing with us photographers. Um, and one thing I will show here is, so for this particular image, and I did do a lot of, I will, will, will do a cropping in Lightroom. And if I choose to use the Lightroom develop raw, then I would do all the processing here before I hand it off to a third party plugin. And to hand it off with a third party plugin, the easiest thing to do is come up to your edit panel or to your preference panel, and now you could choose. So here's external. Photoshop is always up on top. And then on the bottom, you have a host of different ones you could pick. But keep in mind, the file format, the color space, and the bit depth you have control over. One other thing you have control over is the renaming convention. So in this case here, I put Luminar Neo sets where I'm heading. If I were going into a Topaz or uh, On One or something, then I like to rename this file where it says custom. And right here, I would give it another name or just edit or something that tells me that this image was edited with a third party plugin. So I don't think, you know, I'm getting the same results inside Lightroom. So once that's set, you did okay, of course. Then it's just a matter of right clicking, edit in, and then you could choose which third party plugin you want to use to export it in. Now, if you prefer to use a different a raw processor, well, that's where you'd come up here to file, export. And we're so used to this right here, hard drive. We're so used to this export to hard drive. But did you know you can come down and pick a third party plugin? And here's the catch, image format. If you stick to original, then you're going to, it's going to come in as a raw file. If you select TIFF, then you have all the same options here on what you, how you want it to be exported in. So that's a decision you have to make. If you feel real comfortable in Lightroom, I love Lightroom for the digital asset managing part. If you love Lightroom for the processing part, then process all your images inside Lightroom here, then hand it off to a third-party plugin for things that Lightroom doesn't do or doesn't have at its disposal, like sky replacement, or in my case, my sport grit look. Um, I have one slider to make my grit look look the way it does. That's when I would hand it off. So that's kind of my workflow in a nutshell to where you, know, you could use Lightroom like I said, as your digital asset manager to where you could just ingest photos and then from there um, start to select, let's say in this case here, I have a great visual. Now I know Mac has that. Us Windows users, unfortunately, <laughs> Windows doesn't really have a good browser like this where I can look at these images and select which ones I want and then start processing. All right, there we go. So one of the things I think people need to realize is that ideally we have a suite of tools and Lightroom has certain strengths and I'm gonna show you how to do some amazing things in Lightroom 
but then I want you to realize how smooth the handoff is between programs. So in this case, Vanelli was showing you his handoff. I like to actually hand off through Photoshop, and I'm gonna show you why in a moment. It's really seamless. Now, this is gonna sound a little strange, but I'll make an analogy. So like right now, if you were to go and buy a piece of software from Apple, it actually buy, bounces around through a bunch of servers around the world as it goes through different countries for different reasons, because it ends up creating the smoothest experience. Well, that's what happens here. Like Vanelli showed you that Lightroom can hand off the third-party plugins and it works well, but I actually like to go through Photoshop because it lets me keep all of my adjustments non-destructive the whole way. So let me share my screen and we'll start here inside of Lightroom to begin with. So I'm gonna do a combo shot here in Lightroom of merging some images together. So I'll let you vote V. Would you like me to merge <laughs> a panorama or an HDR? What would you like to see? Well, you're extremely uh, popular with your panoramas. So let's do that. All right, so a nice big picture. So with a panorama, what we could do is pan and get multiple shots. And so in an ideal world, you pan the camera and have about a 50% overlap. So you can kind of see that here where the building starts on the one side, then it's in the middle, and then it's on the other side. Well, that gives us a nice range of overlap. What we can do is now merge that. So we actually can just photo merge and say merge panorama. And what this is going to do is combine these images right inside of Lightroom and make a new raw file. Now, there's different methods. <laughs> Cylindrical works really well for a normal scan. Perspective is if you're going off of a center area, but this one wasn't the case. And spherical is normally used if there's multiple rows. But in this case, spherical actually worked a little bit better because we had such depth in the scene. We had the road coming underneath our feet and then the mountain really far away. So there was a lot of depth in the scene. So spherical worked better. Now, you can cheat and say, hey, Lightroom, could you make new pixels for me? That's what Fill Edges does. It does a type of content-aware oh, fill that you used to have to go to Photoshop for. That was pretty amazing. Now, down here, that's a little fake, and I could see it, but over here, look at those clouds and that. Now, it's kind of messing up here. So I'm going to uncheck that for a moment, and instead, I'm going to use Boundary Warp, which literally just stretches the panorama <laughs> to fill in the space, still looking pretty good. And then I could use a little bit of fill edges just to avoid it. And that kind of gives you the maximum image area without having to crop or lose pixels. Now I'm gonna merge those. Now, what it just did is it set that into merge and it's making a new raw file. Now that I get that raw file, I can develop it right here in Lightroom. And there's a lot we can do. But what I wanna take advantage of is getting maximum quality. So as soon as that finishes, you'll see that the file pops up, okay? There it is. And like any other raw file, you are free to develop it. Now, I'm, I'll call it lazy. Some people say efficient. I don't like to have to think about what slider to grab. So I'm gonna teach you some cheating tools in Lightroom. First up, I turn on the clipping indicators. This means blue pixels, too dark, and the red pixels, which is actually the name of my production company, are the <laughs> blown out pixels that are too hot. So the hot pixels or the blown out pixels are red pixels. Those are overexposed. The blue pixels are dark. Well, look, I could just click right here on the histogram and massage this image. Hey, go ahead and recover those highlights. Oh, back off that white point a little bit, boom. I don't have to come over here and grab sliders and guess. I could just pull the histogram into shape. Speaking of pulling things into shape, I'm a huge fan of doing that over here in the tone curve. Click on the little on image tool, and now you could pull the image into shape. Hey, darken the clouds. Oh, let's lift up the forest a little bit and brighten it. But if you want to go a step further, come down to HSL. Hey, let's do green saturation on image tool. Oh, 
Let's go ahead and boost the green a little bit. Cool. Let's come over here to the orange and increase that. And so you can literally just click and drag on an area to affect just that color. Oh, let's tone it down here in the brick. Oh, you know what? I really wish that the green area was a little brighter or darker. And look, no masks, no selections. You're just massaging the color by clicking and dragging on it. Let's control the exposure there on the rooftops. Super simple. Now, we're gonna go to other tools in a moment, but let me know in the chat, have you tried these on image tools before? We did it by just moving the histogram, using the on image tool or targeted adjustment tool here in tone curves, and then doing it down here in HSL, where we can control the hue, the saturation, or the luminance. Hey, I really wish that the grass was a little greener. Go to hue and look, we can make the grass greener or more autumn. Oh, I really wish that the rooftops were a little bit of a different shade. Look at how I can massage that. So a couple of you weighed in on the chat. Hopefully these are new techniques and you haven't tried this before, but these are a way fun way to quickly move those colors around. Cool. All right. Um, I always now, learn something new when I watch you. Uh, in some days. Presentation. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's these color grading tools down here, but here's what I'm going to say. I'm not dissing color grading. I love color grading, but these tools are how I was color grading in Final Cut Pro 7 15 years ago. <laughs> this is not a huge leap forward in terms of color grading. So when I want to do advanced color, I'll do it sometimes in Photoshop and often in Luminar. So full disclosure, Vanelli and I used to work together on Luminar. He's still there. He's doing a great job. Uh, I'm off working on some cool new stuff that I'll be able to share with you guys soon. But it's a cool product for color grading. But watch this. When I'm ready to hand this image off, it is super easy to do so. Now, first off, I'm going to say, hey, let's do some upright. Let's run a balanced fix there. And if you click on these little lines, watch how amazing this is. This lets you say, hey, this should be vertical. I'm sorry, horizontal. This should be horizontal. See? Oh, wow. This should be a vertical. And so should this. And so you can actually define the lines that you want to make things vertical or horizontal. Now, this stair shouldn't actually be level because it wasn't. So I could let it go ahead and be a little bit skewed since there was an angle there. But look at how you can play with those guides and literally reshape the photograph. I like that now. I didn't worry about this one being an actual horizontal line, but I like how this squared up the building and got that to be a nice, strong focal point, right? And you can move these lines. Maybe I want that one to be vertical. There we go. So people click auto and upright and level all the time. But again, beautiful on image tool here. These grid lines, they're amazing. So use these tools to get the job done. Now, leave Lightroom <laughs> and go someplace else. Okay, here's what I want you guys to realize. There's two ways to develop your photos, okay? Just like there's two ways to eat your dinner. So, and if you want the ultimate inconvenience, then congratulations. I would like you to head on over to Kentucky Fried Chicken and get as many of those sporks as they have as possible, or go to a camping store, whatever you want. For those of you who don't know what a spork is, it's a combination of a spoon and a fork. And sometimes they put a little serrated edge on the edge of the spoon so you don't rip your mouth open, but you can like try to maybe cut your food with it. If any of you have gone camping, they've improved these sporks a little bit, but they're a spork. Hey, guess what? Lightroom is a spork. It's a tool. It's super useful. It's great for what it does. And if you really insist, you can do everything in Lightroom. But if you want to have a full course meal with greater control, you get a knife, a spoon, and a fork. Because you should use one tool to organize your images, one tool 
to develop your raw files and one tool to finish the pixels, to polish them. Now, you can do this however you want. I organize my images actually with Mylio, and then I might send them into Adobe Camera Raw through Photoshop or Lightroom or any other way. And Lightroom's got some great tools for organizing pictures as well and editing metadata, so it works too. But when I wanna do advanced editing, I leave Lightroom, watch. What I'm gonna do is hand this picture off to Photoshop. So all I say is that I wanna make this image go into Photoshop. So you can actually open this up into Photoshop pretty easily. Now we're going to take the image and hand it off. So I'll edit this in Photoshop as a smart object. Now, I also want you to notice you could hand off to a whole range of tools, right? The, you know, most plugins actually show up here. It's pretty cool. There's Luminar and AI and uh, I could put Neo in there. There's other ways of accessing, but I like this one, open in Photoshop. Now, what it does is it snapshots my image as is and hands it off to Photoshop, but as a raw, uh, as a smart object. The, what's the benefit of smart objects? Um, non-destructive to where mm -hmm. you can you can do as much editing you want to it, uh, whether you're using third-party plugins or Photoshop. And if you want to back out of it, um, you can go back through and, and actually remove um, the edits that you did. Yeah. And what smart objects do is putting it in, the, in, the, in a container. So if you double click on it, you always see the original file nice and safe. Oh, look, there's all my original sliders from Lightroom. <laughs> I nice. lost nothing. So I know people who go, oh, Photoshop, it's too scary. Well, look, one click and everything I did in Photoshop or in Lightroom came on into Photoshop. So there it is. There's my geometry and my guides and everything else. Look, they're still there. The exact same ones, everything. Oh, I forgot to do lens profile correction. Look, I could fix it later and remove that little curve at the edge. So. V, this means that nothing changed, right? You can edit in Lightroom and then keep going very easily. Click the OK button and it's done. Now, if I want to use a third-party plugin, Photoshop gives us some great flexibility. So I can go to Filter and I can access different plugins, okay? Now, I'm going to go with Luminar AI just because I'm more comfortable with it, but there's lots of tools you can use. And what this will do is hand the image off into the plugin where you can edit it. You can also hand off, I had On One available there, Topaz is available. There's lots of ways. Now I'll do this update later, but I mentioned that I really love Luminar's ability to color grade. So I'm just gonna jump right into the edit module, use a little bit of artificial intelligence to improve the dynamic range of the image, Right? Is it cheating, V, if I use Accent AI? Is this cheating? <laughs> no, because you, otherwise you'd have to do it inside the development module. So instead well, of- Well, I did develop this image and that's the point, right? Like the develop module only goes so far. This makes under the hood masks to enhance those details. Same thing with Sky Enhancer. Look at it brought out the drama in those clouds. So a lot of people think that the only thing that Luminar can do to the sky is replace it. But I actually like how it could bring out the clouds that are there with Sky Enhancer. I'll put a little structure in. This is kind of like Clarity's big brother. And I like that. Looking really solid. Put a little details in. And that small details is really bringing out the trees. Look at that pop there and how the leaves came to light. But by not adding in a lot of detail into the sky, it stays clean. Now I'm going to color grade. So, First up, mystical is basically a beautiful soft glow that just takes the light and diffuses it. It brings out that filmic quality. And then with colorize, you can warm or cool the light that you add to the scene. Then come on down to super contrast. This lets you add contrast in to the highlights, the midtones and the shadows. 
And so it's a zone based contrast system and you can add black in without over clipping things. Then with color harmony, this is super fun. The break these down for me. What do we got going on? So, so up on top, you have the brilliance and warmth. Um, from here, that's a global change, which is going to make everything, you know, either you're either going to saturate or desaturate, and then you can adjust the warmth of um, of the overall appearance of the image. So you can make it cooler, or you can make it a little bit um, warmer. And then the color contrast is targeting the colors themselves. Well, yeah, but it's only one color, which a lot of people miss. So they, they do this. Oh, I don't like that. But look, you can move it. So I could say, oh, put the contrast into the trees. And I love having that extra color contrast there in the trees to bring those to life. So you want to target where that's adding with the hue slider. And then split color warmth. Oh, that's your favorite. Uh, <laughs> I try, Rich. Um, you you just do magical stuff with that. Yeah, so you could actually make you know, the warm, it's targeting the warm and the, and the cool colors, and you could actually adjust them and swap them. Yeah. So I just took that brick that was a little too warm and toned it down without actually affecting the sky. So I could put a little warmth by subtracting cool, and look at how the trees get nice and vibrant. And then for the brick, I could tone that down. So it's really awesome. It's basically, for those of you who remember the McDLT, the warm side warm, the hot side hot, the cold side cold, it gives you full control over both parts of warm and cool in an image. So there's a lot you can do. And then if you head on over to the tool called Mood, you'll find a whole bunch of color recipes. I'm biased, I wrote about half of them, but <laughs> you can go in and pick different flavors here of lookup tables and then adjust them with the amount, the contrast, and the saturation. Now, a couple of you at home are going, oh, it's close, but it's too much. That's what always happens. We start to play with the tool and it's too much. This is why we have the stop complaining at me, dear internet. It's called the master fader, and it lets you fade off the entire filter from 100% to back it off. And I pretty much every time just back it off to about 70 or 80%. And now it just totally solved it. I was able to prevent that from being over the top by just fading it a little bit. I like it. Now I click apply. It's gonna send it back through Photoshop and updates. And when it's done, it's applied non-destructively, meaning it's not permanently changing the pixels. And the thing about that is if you change your mind later, yep. like if you forget that little step that you drilled into us about the master slider, yeah. you can always go back into it and readjust it at that point. Right. So let's save that and watch what happens over here in Lightroom Classic. So it's going to drop it in from Photoshop and it will put it with this photo. So I'm going to just sort here and have a look and look, it put it right next to it. So we've got, that's what I did in Lightroom. And that's what I did where I fixed the lens correction in Photoshop and just used Luminar to bring out a little more of the dynamic range with those color grading tools. But if I ever change my mind, now all I need to say let me stop scrolling. I got one of those new scroll mouses and I'm not quite yeah. used to it yet. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Mental note, turn off Apple scrolling on the mouse. There we go. Carefully move up. You could say photo, edit in Adobe Photoshop. This is to reopen the file and watch what happens. It opens. I'll say edit original. And look, my Photoshop file comes back. If I were to double click, I'd be right inside the raw file, where if I forgot something, I could tweak it. And if I needed to, I could double click and open up my third party plugin and make a tweak and then close and go right back to Lightroom. So 
For those who think that Photoshop is too hard or I don't know why I have it, even this little pass through is worth it because it makes your Photoshop plugins, your Lightroom plugins so much more useful. Because if you make a mistake or you wanna tweak, you can keep coming back all day long. Now, I wanna show you one more thing that you can't do in Lightroom. So let's say we need to wipe out a few of these distracting people, right? <laughs> like my family. <laughs> so I'll leave my family in, but let's get rid of these people over here. What you can do is make a new empty layer. And on that empty layer, you can use tools like the healing brush or spot healing brush. And you're like, how can I heal on an empty layer? All you have to do is say, sample all layers. So now we can do things like take the polygonal lasso and just narrow this selection there, like on the railing. Cool. Grab the healing brush and sample and remove those distracting objects. And it will actually start to blend. Now, if you want, you can also, as you're using that healing brush, switch over to the clone stamp tool because maybe you don't want to heal. Maybe you just want to clone. Oops, let's get in there. And I'll clone here at low opacity and just build that up. And so you can again say sample all layers and use multiple strokes to build that up to hide things. See? And so I'm just sampling the colors and cloning and healing. And because it's on its own empty layer, you could turn it off or on if you want to change your mind or review it. So this makes it simple. So with something really complex here, like this railing that I don't want to destroy, I could literally just carve out the areas of the windows like that. Click. And this lets you do that advanced cloning or healing right within. So there we go. Option click for clone stamp. And I like to use lower opacity so I could just build it up with the brush strokes. See how simple that was, V? You yes. can actually put that on a new empty layer. That way you didn't destroy your smart object or anything inside and it's still non-destructive. So if you mess up or you need to, you can go back and tweak it. There we go. Have you ever tried that empty layer trick, B? <laughs> During one of the recordings we were doing, you, <clears throat> you showed it to me like a minute before we had to do the recording. I was like, oh my God. So I, I, I applied it through mine, but no. Oh, nice, you uh, stole it. <laughs> yes. But there you go. See, by dealing with this tough area here, we could build that up. And that way I didn't destroy the railing and have to worry about cloning it up. Now I can go in there and do a little bit more on that railing to finesse the stray color, but you could really do the advanced stuff in Photoshop because Photoshop is perfect at this advanced cloning and healing because you can't do that in Lightroom, nor can you do it that well in Luminar. But Again, use the right tool for the job. And oh, by the way, if I want to, look at this. You can go in and say, oh, I want to use the sponge tool to soak up color, you know? And so it has its own desaturate mode or saturate. And so that'll allow you to go in and start to do that. And you can desaturate in that area, you know, go in and start to work with it. Or just brush it over. But look at how we were able to take out that distraction. There we go. Close and save. And it goes right back into Lightroom and updates. Just takes a minute. So as soon as it closes and saves, this little distraction there is going to disappear. <laughs> Let me make sure I saved it. I did. Thinking there, that, poof, they're gone. Now, Rich, you like TIFFs a lot better than JPEGs, correct? I do. Um, so you need TIFFs if you want layers. So when you open inside of Lightroom, open in Photoshop, it's up to you, but you can control those settings with your preferences of how does it open when you use the external editors 
And I like TIFFs because a TIFF is the exact same thing as a Photoshop file, but there's one key difference. Do you know what the difference is, V? <laughs> it's the file extension. <laughs> <laughs> much. No, um, the file extension is different and the file is smaller 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 yes but it actually supports layers and everything else so it's a photoshop file that supports the ability to use zip compression and it's super tiny so tiff files are great because you get the benefit of layers with great color quality and no compression artifacts and smaller than photoshop documents all right, I'm going to pass it to you, V, but I see we got a couple of comments in the chat. Folks, feel free to put questions in the Q&A or try some of these techniques out. I hope that this is helpful to you. Glad to see you guys here. So cool. If you got any questions, you can put it in. And we'll be doing a couple more images, and then we'll show you a little bit more of that aftershoot workflow of how easy it is to hand things off. Let me pass back to you, V, and let you do another image. Go ahead and do us an edit, and then show how you enhance it with the third-party plugin. All right. So let me share my screen. All right. Um, well, okay. Being a sports photographer. So let's, and if any of you ever have a chance to try this fog in a can, absolutely amazing. Um, you don't have to worry about it filling up the studio with fog and, and just have the lingering uh, feeling in it. All right, so let's see. So, so, so here, Benelli, be honest. Did you have to keep all of the players from stealing the fog in the can because they were having too much fun with it? <laughs> They, they loved it. Um, yeah, so they, they, they definitely loved it. So let me, I want to, um, um, I'm trying to, uh, what I want to do right here, Rich, is uh, reset this to original. Oh, the whole picture? Just go to the yeah. develop module and reset it. Oh, there we go. Yeah. And then... Hold, Brett, giant bot, bottom corner there, reset. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Rich. No problem. All right. So you mean you want to throw I... away all your hard work and start over? No problem. <laughs> so when when do we jump in to a third party? When do we stay inside Lightroom? In this case here, you know, cropping is cropping. And I do like the 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 way I'm able to apply a crop here. And let's say, come on over. And I know I want this to be the five by four format, because this is going to end up being either an eight by 10, a 16 by 20, a 24 by 36 print or a poster. So that four by five format is what I want. Now, the, the focus is on him, but I do want the football in there so you can tell, yes, this is a football player. And let's bring it up in here. There we go. And I do like the ability to look off to the side. Now I'm looking at this here. If this isn't the format I want, then I can switch over, let's say to a five by seven. And now I have a little bit wider of a, of a, of a scene. And again, it's all non-destructive. So let's start with this here. All right, so now that I have the set, um, I do like to come over and yes, call it cheating if you want. If you're gonna do the raw processing inside uh, Lightroom, I do like coming over and select auto and let auto give it its best shot. I am gonna dial back the exposure just a bit because I wanna make it just a little richer. And overall, I'm happy with it. The red is a little too much for me. So I can either do this here, or once again, I can go into you know, a third party plugin and, and change the, the U saturation and luminance here. So for now, let's go to saturation, red. Actually, let's go to luminance first. Let's bring that red down right about there. That looks good. And saturation. Now, I find that when you're editing, don't look at what you see, but look at what you want it to be. So right now, Yes, I know he's underexposed here, which we're going to fix. I want to bring out the fog more. But right now, I'm at a really good point that I like. Well, I could just right click, edit in. Now, for this one, I'm going to go into Luminar AI. And I want to edit with the Lightroom adjustments. Now, 
Lightroom immediately creates a copy of it. There, there's that copy I, I created. So even if I were to back out of this now and cancel, that copy is still there. So that's a Lightroom thing. Um, like I said, it creates that copy for you. So now that we're here, I'm gonna jump over to edit. And my absolute favorite tool, I think they designed this for me, is gonna be the dramatic tool. So the dramatic tool is that one tool that's gonna to add that grit look that I'm looking for. Let's give it a chance to render. And actually what I should do is I'm gonna close out of Aftershoot. I'm gonna close out of Neo and Aftershoot. There we go. And I'm getting a system warning of my, um, uh, what do you call it? I'm, I'm overusing my system resources. So you're saying you need to buy a new computer. Yes. <laughs> Here we go again with the windows. All right, let me see that. Yeah, so I, I canceled out of it, but that image is still there. So let me go back in again. And now that I've freed up system resources, and that's another thing, when you're working on larger files and you're working with memory intense programs, it's always best to try to keep your system running just what you need and not the, um, the extras. All right, here we go again, edit. And let's give it a second. So, so of course, Rich, during rehearsal, all of this was perfect. Mm -hmm. So the moment, the moment we go live, of course, something happens to it. That's okay. It happens. Yeah. So, and I'm going to try one more thing, Rich. I'm going to cancel out of this. And let's do this. Edit in Neo. Now, like you said, um, I love the fog of the scene, but I definitely have to bring it out more. And that's where I'm going to use the tools at my disposal here to help me uh, bring that along. Here we go. So this dramatic tool is under the create is right here on the creative. And again, I feel that they created this for me because this one slider right here, the amount, <clears throat> and I'm gonna use the contrast, give it a time to render it. It's gonna do the majority of the work that I normally used to do with other tools like Clarity. Um, or structure. And I'm going to bring this up just a bit. Oh, my poor machine. I could, I could hear it. I can hear the fan on Rich um, having a field day with it. So as the moment this comes up, we'll get it. I should be careful not to taunt because I'm working on my Mac Mini as I wait for my Mac Studio Actually, to arrive. So. You know what, Rich? My mistake it was already there. There, there we go. So it's already there. However, what I want to do is now I need to brighten up the scene a bit. I love everything about it, except I got to be careful of saying this. I love everything but his face. Now, I love how it's lit evenly around, but I do need, look at that. I need to bring out his face. Yep. And here we go. And it's and doing then, a nice job. It's not shifting his skin tone. It's just adding some natural light in there to lift up the shadows. Exactly. And then I'm going to bring this in here. And now before I add the vignette tool to tie it all in, this was a tool you introduced me to that you loved, uh, Tone. So again, I'm going to think global. I'm going to affect the entire image. But after I affect the entire image, I'm just looking at these cloud, at the smoke. So my focus is strictly on the smoke. There's shadows. Here's highlight. Again, I'm looking at what I want it to be and not what I see. Now, each of the tools has a mask. Here's where I'm going to paint in the effect, just in this area up here, while where the fog is. So I'm going to bring it in. Now, that light is going to touch around them a little bit. And you'll get the idea here. And now, I took that fog and instead of applying it on him, I just want it to be in a local area. So I apply 
a global change. And then from there, nice. make sure that it's a local change. Very flexible. And then, yep. And then one more, two more tools. When you structure, because this is not going to affect his skin, but look what it's doing to the, the cloud or to the smoke behind him. Yeah, I like how it's bringing out the fabric as well. Yep. And then boost is going to come in and boost is going to intensify what the amount is doing. And then we'll finish off with the vignette tool. And I love how I could just click on an area. I'm going to go to an extreme so you can see this. So if I could click just on an area here, and in this case on his face, dial it back. But the real beauty about this is right down here is this inner light. So I'm going to bring that light right back. And something Rich, you've always said to us, if somebody says to you, that's a beautiful vignette, you've gone way too far. So here is before and after. So it's just give that kiss of light where I need to look. So we started with this here and we purposely brought it in a little bit dark so we could finish it off here. Again, seeing what I want the end result to be, not what it looks like. Then once we hit apply, it's gonna make its changes and now it's gonna export it off into Lightroom. Now for us Windows users, if this does not appear from here, if it doesn't appear side by side, instead of capture time, change this to file name, and then you'll notice it'll appear. So if you're having issues- I don't think that's just Windows V, unless they fixed it on the Mac. Isn't that everybody? Oh, I thought it was just Windows. Is no, that's one of those things that- <laughs> yeah, just I don't work at Skyler anymore that I could just say, they really need to fix that because it's a checkbox inside of the Lightroom plugin SDK that would solve that. It's and, just a single checkbox that the developer needs to check. Yeah, so if I do, I'm gonna go back to capture time. So there I am at capture time and sure enough, it did. It did bring oh, it did. right they next to each other. <laughs> yep. I wonder why. <laughs> Rich is very influential. Um, yeah, Rich is very annoying. <laughs> but no, but I, I mean, but you saw that. It's a beautiful before. picture, V. I love that. It looks great. Yeah, that, that used to take, that used to take hours to do that sports grit look. And then I was all excited that I got it down to four minutes per image. And now I'm able to do what we just did and batch process them on all the images. Awesome. Well, we're going to take a look at Aftershoot in one moment, but we're going to play a game here, V. So you get to pick the photo that I'm going to develop. So uh, <laughs> obviously, you know, these are all pictures I'm moderately familiar with, but I'll let you choose which image we tackle. So uh, pick a number. Um, seven. Seven. So we already did that one. That was yeah, the panel. Yeah. All right, so let me, let me go to Pick anything all the way through 41 is fine. Anything except uh, the panel that we did. Which one? 23. 23, okay. So here, this is actually a time-lapse sequence. So it's pretty low, but this is water. So we're dealing with some tough recovery detail there. Of course, you're drawn to the beach, <laughs> but uh, there's some things to pay attention to. So look at the histograms and see what's happening in that image. And notice with the raw file, as I start to recover those midtones there, I could really fix things. So again, wow. knowing how to massage the histogram is incredibly important. So this is one of those times of day. This was shot at, I don't know, I'd like to call it two o'clock ugly hour. So <laughs> like the sun is just miserable. And I know in Florida, there's never a miserable sun be, but I was in a different part <laughs> of the world where the sun was miserable. It was just boring and right overhead and very hot. And by default, the sky was like that, you know, it just blew out in the camera. The camera couldn't deal with it. But by massaging the histogram, you can really get it there, which is quite amazing. Then if you need a little bit more, Lightroom has these great tools here. You can click and say things like select sky. And it will use AI, analyze, 
and make a new mask on the sky. And it did pretty well. Got a little water here, but that's probably going to be okay, actually. Look how it cut around the rock. So now what I can do is massage that sky more. Now, I'm not going to take the global exposure down much, but I'm going to boost the contrast in the sky, just the sky, and look at how the clouds come to life. But instead of overdoing contrast, watch this recipe. Whites up, highlights down. Now, don't go so far that it clips. But whites up, oh, nice. highlights down, shadows up, blacks down. That's the secret, guys. You want to do some really simple contrast. And so contrast is not made by cranking on the contrast slider. Contrast is made by pulling your whites and highlights in opposite directions and your shadows and black point in opposite directions. I mean, look at what that did to the sky there. It's just really quite lovely, right? Yeah, it looks like it's so, a totally different image. Yeah, look at how it just brought the sky to life. So take advantage of that. Now, a little touch of clipping, that one little white spot in the cloud, I'm okay with. Now, here's what I want you to think about. First up, always rename things. So I'm gonna call this sky adjustment, right? Cool. Now I'm gonna duplicate it and I'm gonna call it other adjust and simply click here and say, you know what? Let's choose that mask. And what I wanna do is actually just invert that. So you can play with these masks here. You can add, you can subtract. You can see that you can actually intersect here. So you could start to tweak them and play with how do they actually work? So let's go ahead in here. I always struggle with this V. I forget where the magic combination is to invert the mask. I think I got to select it. And then there's somewhere where there's an invert. I can't remember where it's hidden. There it is, invert, yep. boom. So now it flipped the mask and got everything down below. So what I can do here is play with the shadows and the black point. So I can say, hey, you know what? Let's not get quite so aggressive there, but let's use this to massage the rocks, get those to be the right exposure, cool. And sometimes you actually subtract contrast and then put it back in with clarity. Look at that little trick. This is one of those things that people forget. Sometimes you subtract before you add. So clarity is targeted contrast. So by taking down the contrast first, it recovered all those issues in the rocks. And then clarity and texture made those rocks come to life. And now I could just play with the white point or the black point there so that we don't have too many shadows and put a little color in to the rocks as well. And look at the water too, V. You see that if I nice. toggle that on and off, you see how the water and the rocks look three-dimensional? So does that work for you? Nice. Now, where was oh. that taken? Uh, this was taken in, gosh. I think Curacao, and uh, this is like just a, a basic DNG file. I shot this, uh, you know, this is shot, gosh, at this point, eight years ago, so wow. seven years ago. So there's so much you can do even on older pictures to enhance them. That's why I like to come back and redevelop my old files. One mistake people make is they go, I got to buy a new camera. I got to buy a new camera. Yeah. Sometimes you can go back with new technology and make your old files look amazing because it's not just the camera sensors that have gotten better. The software has gotten better. So this lets you create a mask and notice there how easy it is. And so what I'm gonna do here is do a radial gradient because you know, you're know you absolutely right, Fee, like the vignette tool inside of Lightroom is awful. Like it's just a global vignette. 
But I could make a new mask here and say, oh, okay, let's go ahead here and make that as a radial gradient. Oh, interesting. And so you can start to place that there. So I'll just say, hey, new radial gradient. And then you can click to define it. And I could say, there's my radial gradient. I wanna put this over here on this area of the rock. And I wanna stretch that a little bit to be more of an ellipse and not quite so tall. And let's angle that a little bit and position it. And now what you can do is a much more advanced than yet. See? So I'll just click on the mask so it's active. I'm gonna turn off the overlay now. And look, brighten or darken. And using that mask there, it's controlling where it goes. And so I could actually just invert this here. There we go. And now look at how it's controlling where the vignette is being drawn. So you can do some really cool things by using those ellipses as a very targeted adjustment. And then again, feel free to hand off photo and you can just open that in, edit in as a smart object in Photoshop. Photoshop will pick up the file, all the masks, everything's intact. Feel free to do whatever you want over here or take advantage of third-party plugins. So I'll go ahead this time and use on one effects. And I love some of the borders they have here in on one effects, as well as a couple other tools. And so same thing, it'll open up the image non-destructively. And I've got a great listing here of different presets that I can use. Some of these are gonna be film stock simulations, for example. And I could use this to apply more of a digital film treatment to it. And you see different color grades that you could apply. Puts a little grain in, a border in, for example. And you can do a lot of fun stuff. And then as you take a look there, you can continue to modify these. And so there's just a lot of great effects in here. You can play with them. Some cool black and white looks, other options here. See, a little bit of flares, for example, Put a little sun flare in there. And look at that nice, rich color. Let's just back off the glow a little bit in the amount. So it's a little more subtle. I like it. And then I could just click and send that on its way. So this works really nicely because again, all these things work together. So when I click done, it updates, hands it off to nice. Photoshop as the smart object. So it'll take a second there, drops it in. Close. I'm sure that was like one of your throwaway shots thinking Totally. Yeah. <laughs> right. It was a total throwaway shot. I was just shooting some time lapse of the water coming in and out on an interval. And that's actually a trick. Like with your interval, instead of like trying to get the perfect wave, you could just let the camera roll. And that's what I did here is I just shot a whole bunch of different shots of the water coming in. And I just let the camera go on an interval until I got to a good one that I liked. But, you know, look at the changes there of how much we are able to bring out. So there's the Lightroom adjustment. And there it is with that little use of the third-party plugin to bring it to life. So much that these tools can do, guys, that are awesome. Nice. All right, speaking of tools and things that are awesome, I wanna take a moment, and V, we're gonna come back to you for one more tip before we wrap up. But I wanna take a moment to show and tell people a little bit more about Aftershoot. So thanks to the folks at Aftershoot for sponsoring our get together. Aftershoot is a great add-on that works seamlessly with Lightroom, also works with Lightroom Classic, Capture One. And what it's designed to do is to save time. So it will take a look at your images, identify the ones that are best within a group. So it's designed to analyze all your photos from a particular shoot and identify the ones that are most usable. And so now you're like, how in the world can it know? But what it does is it has about 14 different under the hood artificial intelligent tests that it does. And so it can identify all the pictures that are similar. 
then it looks at those and it picks the best one within. So if there's multiple images that are similar, it'll identify the one best. Now, if you only have one photo of something, it's not going to throw that away, but it narrows it down when you shoot burst. So it's great for portraits and other things, but even sports and eagles. Aftershoot has a free version, and the free version is able to detect things like closed eyes and blurry photos. The professional version is $10 a month, and it also has the ability to automatically recognize the best images and sneak previews are images that are gonna do well on social media. So they analyzed half a million photos and what did great on Instagram. And it can actually analyze your pictures and identify the ones that will do better on social media. All right, let me go ahead and show you how that works really quick. So V, you gave them a nice overview. I'm just gonna show really quick how it works again. So with Aftershoot, all you do when you're ready is click and say, I wanna add a new album. Then you add a folder, pick the ones you want and just choose something here. So I'll choose this one, which is actually a photo shoot you did several years back. And very quickly, these load in. So it's gonna go through, load in all the pictures, identify them, and you can use this like any other tool and start manually culling. But the goal here is it's gonna find all the variety of the shots, okay? Now, let me go ahead here, look at this. And you can sort the photos in different ways. I'll go by file name. And you, know, you can quickly go through and see what's there and how they organize. But what you ultimately do is you're gonna click start culling. And now it's pretty simple. Hey, do I want blurred pictures? No, make sure that everything is perfectly in focus. Or you know what, little shallow depth of field, that's okay. Hey, go ahead and start putting duplicates together. This means that it's gonna make a lot of different sets versus try to combine things often. Extreme is really useful if you've got long time periods between shots, but if you're shooting things like sports or portraits, strict works pretty well. How many duplicates? Top 20%, top 30%, top 10%. And then how many images should it flag for social media? Under advanced, you can say, hey, detect if the eyes are closed, detect if it's blurry, and if it's a true duplicate, like if there's actual dupes in there. Then you set the stars and colors. You can have it change the color label, change the star ratings. I'll make that one four star, for example, or add keywords. And if you've already put them in Lightroom, just uncheck this box. And so instead of overwriting stars and colors that you've already used, it'll only rate the ones that don't have ratings, but will put the keyword on everything. So that works really well if you've already imported it into Lightroom or into Classic or Capture One. Click the next button and start, and it queues up the magical unicorns. So we'll let this run run in the background. There's about a thousand pictures. That's probably gonna take it about five, six minutes to finish. But I'll show you another album that it did. So while that's running in the background, I'll go here to this event. And so what I was able to do was let it analyze photos that we took at my daughter's Eagle Scout ceremony. And I could say, you know, show me all the pictures or go ahead and only show me the ones without duplicates. And what it did here is every place where there is a plus indicated, that means that there was more than one photo. So if we go here, it says, hey, there's three similar. This is the one it identified as the five star. But it automatically finds each face this is even in the free version. Oh, you can nice. quickly audit each face to see, you know, if you like the expressions real easily. You can use the up and down arrows here to step through. And if you like one better, S will swap or A will add. Press the right arrow and you go right to the next group of photos, right? And so I can go ahead and zoom right back out. But this makes it super simple to check. 
And so, you know, I could say, you know what? I do agree. That was the best facial feature. Great. Let's go to the next one. Quickly scan. Yeah, that one looks good. And so you can start to trust the AI on these group portraits. Now, my son clearly <laughs> noticed that he had <laughs> some cupcake on his face, but I love their facial expressions here, you know, and you can step through. And again, if I decide that I also like one of these, let's see here. See, my eyes were closed there. That's why it was a one star. But you know what? I like this one too. So what I can do is simply press A for add, and now it gets added to the selection. Super simple. When you're all set, you could just say save changes and it captures the project. And then if it's already in Lightroom, <clears throat> tell it to rewrite the XMPs. If you need to go to Lightroom, click export, and it will cue the handoff to Lightroom or Lightroom Classic or Capture One, or move them into a folder for you. So it's super simple. So it really is meant to be a great time saver, and it just narrows down how much work you have to do. So I hope that that makes sense. You can see here, this one needs about another three minutes, but it's literally processing. I mean, V, this is a two day shoot, right? Yeah. You captured a thousand photos. How long would it take you to sort through these? Oh, Actually, let me ask you this. How long did it take you to sort <laughs> Because I hired you for this photo shoot, you did the job. I loved your pictures, but yeah. you know, we were dealing with four or five kids at once. You know, one might have their eyes closed. One might have a bad smile. Like, I'm sure that this could have saved you days of editing time. Yes. Yes. And especially at that point, uh, because the lighting was atrocious at first, I tried doing bracketing and realized, eh, I'm not doing a new bracketing, bracketing on this. Um, yep. So, yeah, but selecting the photos, you're right. It took longer for me to select the photos than it, is to shoot, than it did to actually take the shots. Um, we had a great, this was for CASA, Court Appointed yep. Special Advocacy Group. And of course, in between breaks, we just had a little fun with the, each of the kids. And, yeah. and here's a good point, Rich. That was, this wasn't required, him walking on the, down the, um, the lockers like this. But some of the shots we got candid like that, they ended up using for the, the project. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're shooting, sometimes you shoot what the client wants, but then if you have time, shoot what you feel they may need. Absolutely. Yeah, just a great time saver. Well, I want to see how this pans out because we have a thousand shots, but it's going to take a minute 40. So <laughs> while that's running, let me put up a couple of resources. First up, if you want to get a discount on Aftershoot, head on over to Photo Focus and we'll save you $10 on an annual membership. We've also got a link to a special version on Luminar that will give you some access to free training and some other bundles. So just on head, on, head on over to photofocus.com. And you'll see all of our sponsors there. So you can check out Aftershoot. You can check out Mylio. You can check out Luminar and Topaz and other products. And we also have new articles every single day. So we've been publishing now for 23 years. We've got one of the best teams of photographers on the planet. If you're interested in writing, we're always looking for new folks as well. So feel free to let us know. But you can find some great resources there. So thanks to Aftershoot. Do feel free to check out Benelli. Now, V, you're doing live hangouts every day, right? People can drop in and learn how to edit pictures. And you yeah. have a live webinar pretty much every lunchtime. Yes. And you taught me what a coffee break was, timing. So, yes. Yeah, so for 10 minutes, we, um, we have the official coffee break. And then at the end of that, we do a questions and answer, uh, ask me anything segment to where they can ask any questions about the current topic. And once that's done, then they can ask questions about photography, photo shoots, what gear to buy, um, how if they're having issues with the software and things along those lines. So the yep. first 10 minutes, yep, we, I stick to your format, coffee break. <laughs> so if you just want to learn a software tip, show up for 10 minutes. If you want to have a friend to hang out and talk photography with every single day, uh, five days a week, you're there. So you guys can find out more about that over at Insiders uh dot skylum.com right they can find out the links and you also have it on the youtube channel i believe yes okay so do check that out let's see how our shoot is doing there we go 
Looks like it's just about done. So you can see that it's calculating here. So what it's gonna be able to do is sort all of those. And again, it's automatically finding this. So you can see here, it's starting to build. So if I go to selected, it's already finished processing these. And so I can click to open that up and see. And so this allows me to go, okay, well, there was nine shots there. Yeah, that actually is the best. I love all the facial features, you know? And so you can see what's happening as you move through and go group to group. And so this is gonna find the best images within each one and allow you to find the ones with the sharpest focus, the best exposure, the best facial teacher features. And so it's really fast guys, and it just runs totally in the background. And what's cool, the more you use it, it actually learns from you and learns what you like so that it will start to get smarter with its picks. So pretty cool stuff. I think that's a great add-on to anybody, particularly if you're shooting portraits, but it actually works great for my landscape and nature shots as well. And what it's able to do is find the best image within each group of photos and pulls those out. So that just helps you take that really giant shoot and cut it down. So if I say, you know what, go ahead and narrow that to without duplicates. We went from having oh. you know, a thousand shots and it's still finishing the call here, guys, but we're gonna get down to probably the best hundred shots. And remember, if there's a bad shot, it's still in there because it picks the best of each one. But what it's doing is, is it's finding the best shot within each burst group. So that really makes it easy to narrow it down and find the best shot for emotion. Great. Well, V, I appreciate it joining today. Do you got one more tip you want to show us really quick before we wrap up? Yep. And yeah, let me share my screen here. I, and Rich, you know what? I, I'm glad you showed them all my all the images. Remember the old attitude, the difference between a good photographer and a great photographer is the greats never show you all their images. Garbage. You know, we take just as many bad photos as we do good photos. The difference is you, the hard part is picking the good so photos from the bad photos. Exactly. <laughs> and, and you get to the point to where um, you get this down to a science to where it's so quick. Let me make sure that's out. Sorry. Uh, cancel. There we go. Uh, you get it down to where you can pump out the great photos quicker. So I just wanted to show you this one real quick because I love one of the new tools inside um, uh, Neo that Lightroom doesn't have, and that's this power line removal. So under the erase tool, and here's remove power lines, one click, and I notice the more complicated the image is with these power lines, the better of a job it does. Look at that. In one click, it was able to remove that. However, I did notice um, this particular image here, for example, uh, let me re reset it. So here's the original. And I thought for sure that it would do an amazing job. So I just want to make sure you're managing expectations that, yeah, it's going to do a great job. However, it's not going to do a perfect job. And that's okay. It's going to get us there. So from Lightroom, you edit the image the way you want it jump over again to a third party plugin. In this case, the power line removal would take forever to do in Photoshop. And you'd have to develop lots and lots of skills. And here it did it in a short time, but then you go back through and here's quality control. So you go in and there are some spots that, you know, it, it got a little confused. Like in this area here, let's do this and then bring this in here, but I want to restore it. Yep, and it still needs more. Actually, that, that looks good there. So I could clear that part, but this area right here, I could restore it. Maybe this right here, I can remove it. And then once it's done, no. We have a before and after. Here's before. Here's after. And then bring it back into Lightroom and continue with your edits or 
have it as is. But the whole key, again, like we mentioned earlier, is in your workflow, work, work the way you want. And there's so many different tools you could use that that's going to help you enhance it. That, that, that after shoot, I mean, I got to admit, Rich, um, when I first did it, <laughs> I, brought, I brought in 10,000 photos and I said, Brian, this thing is slow. He goes, well, what did you do? I said, I just brought in my entire collection. He goes, no, it's called after shoot. Did you shoot 10,000? Oh yeah, that makes sense. And now the tool, I brought it in and you saw how fast it did those selections for me. And that just saves time. Is it cheating? I don't care. You know, it, it's, it's your art director behind your, looking over your shoulders saying, no, no, yes, yes. Yeah, so. it's not cheating. You know, what it was able to do there was find the best image of each one. And so oh every God. one of these things that says plus means that there was multiple photos to choose from. So instead of having to pick between two images there, it found the right one or looking at all four or five images. It just speeds up the time. So if you're shooting especially portraits or repeated action, and what we can do here is if we don't like the call or we want to change the criteria, it's much faster the second time. So it took 11 minutes the first time. I could restart the call and just say, you know what? Go ahead and group more duplicates together and be a little bit stricter there about the blurred photos. And, you know, don't pick so many duplicate photos and less sneak peeks. And now the second time through, it's only gonna take about three minutes to call because it's already wow. analyzed the pictures. So if you get too many photos or you wanna tweak it, you can go through and quickly reassess and recall. And so you can see there how it's just flying through and it's gonna start narrowing this down. And so that's gonna let me get to a much smaller selection of images and it was more aggressive in the groupings. So here, it, because I removed the time constraints, it didn't matter that you were taking, you know, about three minutes to get all those pictures. It just said, oh, real similar facial features, real similar composition. Let's group those together and pick the best ones. And so you can see there that it's now being more aggressive and narrowing it down. And so this works great to really just narrow down your number of pictures and you can fly through and find the best shots. So I hope that that makes sense to everyone. And again, with one click, it's gonna hand it off to Lightroom or Lightroom Classic or Capture One. So guys, thanks so much for coming. V, thanks for being our guest. Uh, anything else you wanna let people know where they can catch up with you or learn more? I know, and I'll just say, you got a ton of articles over on Photo Focus. Yes. And thanks for wearing your Photo Focus shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my son stole my Photo Focus beanie. Um, we were out the other day and I looked over at him. Say, hey, that's where that went. Um, yeah, I look good in this. So, um, but yes, photo focus. Uh, if you need articles and tips and tricks on everything from photography to um, reviews on camera gear, that's the place to go. And on photo focus for myself is photofocus.com forward slash author forward slash Mr. Vanelli. So, but yes, thank you so much, Rich, for giving me the platform to uh, show people today skills Absolutely. and stuff. And we had a great question from Michael. He's saying, hey, if I bring in uh, something back from a plugin, can I copy and paste the plugin edits to the full edit? And the answer is no, Michael, because Lightroom can only copy and paste its basic adjustments, but there are ways to hand things off. So uh, you can hand off multiple images with some plugins. So Luminar only takes one picture at a time when you hand off, but you can actually transfer multiple files into Luminar using, there's a different mode that you can transfer. And you also have some other plugins that do let you do batch processing with Lightroom. So Perfectly Clear, for example, is one of those ones where you could send over, say 20 pictures from Lightroom and, and do the copy and paste over there for their portrait tools and then send it back. So some plugin manufacturers do batch processing some are more single image processors. So it just depends on the tool. So hopefully that helps you understand. But we weren't bashing on Lightroom today. Lightroom is an incredible raw developer with some great options in there for really controlling things with masks. But it is a non-destructive editor. 
And so non-destructive editors are limited in the types of adjustments they can do. But you saw Vanelli and I make a lot of very selective contrast types adjustments and really deep color adjustments. Those cannot be do, done inside of a tool like Lightroom because it's a parametric image editor and it just doesn't do that type of editing. So for those of you who are here earlier, that's why we made the analogy of a spork versus a knife, a foon, and a spork. Uh, a knife, a foon, foon? <laughs> it's a long night. A knife, a spoon, and a fork. So for me, I like to organize my images using Mylio. Then I will develop my raw files, usually using Adobe Camera Raw. Sometimes I go through Lightroom. I also just sometimes open it up right in Camera Raw, which is the engine that Lightroom has. And then I'll often finish by either going to Photoshop or handing off to a third-party tool. And that's fine because organizing your images, decoding your raw files, and finessing the finished pixels are three distinctly different tasks. So don't feel like you have to only use one tool. And as you saw tonight, real photographers bounce between tools. And like Vanelli said, you know, some photographers will never show you their mistakes. Sometimes things you think of as mistakes are just things that need a little extra love because maybe it was the perfect emotion or the perfect moment. So don't write those files off immediately. I mean, I got to admit, B, like there's so many pictures that we used to throw away that yes. now software can help with. And I don't think it's cheating. I think part of photography is to capture the moment. And part of photography is to nail everything in the camera settings. But I will always choose capturing the moment over getting perfect exposure or perfect sharpness. So uh, Michael, you said, what were those three things? One is organizing the images, which is like picking out the best photos and adding metadata. So you saw tonight, we were picking out the photos using Aftershoot, identifying the best pictures. Then there's the raw decode or developing the raw file. And then you have the finessing of the pixels where you do the fine tuning, the finishing. So this is totally normal. And you know, my analogy of the knife, knife, spoon, and fork versus a spork is you don't have to be an expert. I mean, we're not talking like go get the little shrimp fork and the like the butter <laughs> knife plus the steak knife plus you know 15 pieces of silverware. Just don't think it's weird to use three tools to get the job done because that lets you pick the right tool for the job. And, well, Vanelli, thanks really, for joining us. And uh, did, anything did else you on your mind before this? we call this here? Did you notice I did this, Rich? Because that's going to be a very good one? article. <laughs> so, 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 Rich has a way of just saying things that come natural, and then we write it down and we write articles based on that. But this <laughs> definitely is a perfect article: organizing, developing raw, and finessing. Thank you, Rich. No problem. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us and uh, feel free to head on over to Photo Focus. And for those of you watching the replay, we hope you enjoyed this Lightroom Hangout. And again, a big thanks to our partners over at Aftershoot for helping put on this event. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.